readings this morning, one from Psalm 23, the other from Matthew 18. So Joy's uh, other Joy is going to read Psalm 23. Come forward, Joy. And then Doreen's going to follow on with Matthew 18. Good morning. Are we all happy? We have the Lord on our side? Yes. Uh, We've already sung this psalm this morning, and it's a wonderful psalm I think many of us would know. So here I go. It's Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He settles me down in green pastures, and he leads me beside the quiet waters. He brings me back and causes me to repent. He guides me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. This be the word of the Lord. The second reading is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 10 to 14, and can be found on page 985 of the Church Bible. The parable of the wandering sheep. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you that the angels in heaven always see the face of my Father in heaven. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away? Will he not leave the 99 on the hills and go to look for the one that wandered off? And if he finds it, truly I tell you, he is happier about that one sheep than about the 99 that did not wander off. In the same way, your Father in heaven is not willing that any of these little ones should perish. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dean's speaking this morning, so let's pray for him uh, as we come to this preached word this morning. Father, we do thank you for Dean. We thank you for his enthusiasm for your word and his desire to preach it. And we pray, Lord, that you will bless him as he brings this message to us this morning. Lord, may we have open hearts to receive it, hearts that are softened by you. Lord, that you may be at work in us through the power of your word and by your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we may understand and that we may grow in the likeness of Jesus. We pray for your blessing now upon Dean. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As you know, I've been going through a series on the Good Shepherd. And um, this is the third in the series. There's one more left. I think it's about a month's time. And um, so I kind of read this book by Kenneth E. Bailey, and it kind of really sort of, I've always had a fascination of the, the, um, the lost sheep. <laughs> Perhaps it's because I, like everyone else, are lost sheep, or at least have been, um, during our, t- our walk on this planet. And um, it just kind of says quite a lot to me. I'm hoping you kind of pick some of that up as well. I have found this sermon particularly difficult to write, and um, I have been convicted of a number of sins as I've prepared this. So, you know, God's word is a double-edged sword. And so if you might, if you might find little bits of this pay, uh, painful and a bit sharp, I have also had to repent of a number of things. So, um, and that's a good thing. You know, we have a loving father. He loves us very much. And because of Jesus, we can have confidence through him that we are saved, we are forgiven, and that God wants us to be with him, actually within his warm embrace. Okay. So I started off by looking, Simon 1 was looking at Psalm 23, and as King David identified God as his good shepherd. And like everyone, like us, we kind of reflect back on our life periodically, and David did the same. And he reflected how his heavenly father had provided for him, looked after him, and had led him like a a real life good shepherd. 
And my prayer is, I hope, that we will know that for ourselves as well, that we will know that Heavenly Father is a good shepherd for us. I then looked at um, the Sermon 2 last, last few, uh, month or so ago, um, the prophetic account of Ezekiel, who picked up David's psalm and added bad shepherds to it. And God used Ezekiel and spoke of a time when he would replace these bad shepherds and place over them one shepherd, my servant David, who would tend them and be their shepherd. In essence, he is predicting for the time of Jesus. I then, during that sermon, talked about the New Testament, and that was Luke 15, where Jesus is having a discussion with the Pharisees about table fellowship. And in essence, is what kind of people should we associate, associate with if we really want to be holy and please God? Jesus identified himself through that parable of the lost sheep as the good, he identified himself as that good shepherd in Psalm 23. And that his missionary purpose was to save all lost sheep. So we have here that Jesus is actually using the parable of the lost sheep. And he is speaking at this point to the Pharisees. And he is speaking particularly because they had kind of ignored all those people who were outside their clique. And he was saying, look, you've got it wrong, guys. Now, Jesus is a very good preacher. And he's able to use and adapt that same metaphor, the lost sheep, to to teach different audiences how to live authentic, godly lives. As I said, Luke 15 is Jesus recording what Jesus said to the Pharisees. Who are, who are currently despised and rejected people like tax collectors and the common people. The Pharisees tended to view these people as kind of, well, not really lost, but kind of they had no hope. And unsurprisingly, the tax collectors and a lot of these common people thought they had no hope either. Hardly surprising when the Pharisees had told them this for many, many years, because you weren't like us. You didn't have any there weren't any hope for you. You had no hope. But Jesus, Jesus' mission was to communicate that their lives were not one of hopelessness, but instead that he was their hope of reconciliation with God. And in fact, this was the very reason why he was living amongst them at that very time. He also called those Pharisees and his disciples to be like him and to seek out those lost sheep. And that was effectively the Great Commission. Now, today's sermon is really looking at Jesus talking to his disciples. So he's still going to use the lost sheep. So before he was talking about the Pharisees, the religious community. Now he is speaking to those who are around him. In many respects, we are, we are also his disciples. And he also speaks through the lost sheep to us as well. There are two parts to this sermon, and the one is about what do we mean by the little ones who we're not, not to despise, and part two, we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about the significance of the one and the 99 in the parable of the lost sheep. So that's where we're going this morning. Okay, number one, who are the little ones we are not instructed to despise? Now, in the first year of Jesus' ministry, he was followed by large, adoring crowds. And Mark 1.45 says that Jesus was so popular that he could not openly enter a town, but was obliged to remain in the countryside, and that people came to him. Many people decided to follow him. But as time passed, they found that the chosen path was a narrow way, and that each disciple was expected to carry a cross. Some of these crowds and followers decided that the price to follow Jesus was too high and the path too too steep. And so many of these disciples drew back and no longer went about with him. This is in John 6, 66. 
but between those who followed and those who drew back, we can assume that others did their best to follow Jesus, but were not prepared for the rigors of the way, and they went astray. These people did not reject Jesus, but had simply fallen behind and had lost their, sheep, uh, lost their way. So some people started following Jesus and then at some point found it was too hard and rejected him. They said, no, he isn't the way for me. But there were equally other people who just found the way to, um, found it harder than they had expected. So in so Matthew 18, verse 10, there's a question really. Who were the little ones that Jesus was telling his disciples not to look down on? The little ones were those people who had strayed because they weren't able to keep up with the other sheep. These were the people who had found that following Jesus or the Christian faith, if we're talking about nowadays, was harder than they first, first thought. They were referred to as the little ones, not because they were very young people, but because of the assumptions made by others, members of the community of faith, or the Christian community, as it were. The sheep had strayed, and as followers of Jesus, they needed help. These people were not dropouts. These little ones were not dropouts. Apparently, some of Jesus' followers were saying, if they can't keep the pace, too bad. We must press on. It is easy to despise those who slow you down and need special attention. Not so with Jesus, the good shepherd. Now, this kind of really convicted me when I kind of started to prepare this sermon and read, read about this scripture. And it made me think about, what about my attitude to the little ones? Sometimes when I go on walking holidays, I tend to kind of be right at the front and I kind of press on and, um, you know, I tend to rush. Of course, other people don't find it as easy. And I'm trying to think about my attitude towards that, which has probably not been very godly and I've probably been very unsympathetic and yes, I haven't been very sensitive to those around me. And I think we can kind of do that sometimes in our Christian faith. And again, I, you know, I'm the kind of person that throws myself into things like this. And, and it's very easy to be, I won't say neglectful, but yeah, insensitive and unfeeling to those around me. And for that, I, you know, the times I have done that, I repent. And if I've done that in this church, I apologize. There are many others in the church, and this may be, you know, if, maybe something that we probably, other people need to repent over in this church. And later on, I'm just, just get you to reflect on that. What is our attitude to those people in the church that have a slightly different journey than ours? who perhaps don't necessarily make the progress that we think they should, or perhaps are taking their journey a little bit more slowly. You know, what, is our, what is our feelings towards that? I might come back to that later on. So what does Jesus do with the little ones who have lost their way, who perhaps have been a little bit left, um, left behind, who can't keep up with the pace? We can easily make wrong assumptions about those lit- who those little ones actually are. After all, were not Jesus' disciples also example of little ones who had lost their way? Did not Peter deny Jesus three times, despite boasting that he would never reject Jesus? Did not Thomas vehemently doubt Jesus' resurrection? Did not the ten disciples run away in the Garden of Gethsemane and were not heard again until Easter morning, 
did they not also stray from the path? We can make assumptions about those who we think are the mo- who are most secure in their faith and seem to be racing on with boldness and confidence. But as Proverbs 16, 18 says, pride goes before destruction and a haughty or arrogant spirit before a fall. So what is Jesus' response to such people? Well, if we looked at what happened to the disciples in John 20, verses 19 to 23, when the disciples had locked themselves into a room, so they had fled. And this is basically Easter Sunday. I think it's after, yeah, during Easter Sunday. Jesus appears in their midst. So they'd locked themselves into a room, and Jesus appears. So what takes place? But the disciples had probably expected a tongue lashing. Jesus had every right to despise these little ones. Where were they when Jesus needed them the most? Hadn't they broken the bonds of loyalty with him by running away and denying them? How would we have responded if our friends and those who meant most to us responded this way? So how does Jesus respond? Peace be with you. That's what Jesus says to them. They were frightened. They were insecure. Jesus comes into their presence. They were probably all over the place in their minds. What does this mean? How do they feel in terms of how they treated Jesus? And he just cuts through all that and he says, peace be with you. And what was the reaction of the lost little ones? This is John 20, 20. They were overjoyed. The times we kind of get lost, we get left behind. You know, Jesus... He's going to say, peace be with you. And like that parable we'll look at later on, he rejoices when he finds those lost sheep. The times that we kind of get left behind or we wandered off. Or we wandered to new pieces of grass, which is kind of Psalm 23. And we feel we've been left, left alone. Jesus comes alongside us and says, peace be be with you. So how does this relate to us? We all need to be careful on our journey with Jesus. We are called to be humble and dependent on him. And it's easy for each one of us to become overconfident on how well we think we are doing. The Christian faith and being a disciple isn't easy And there are people in this church, I've said on a number of occasions, who are finding that path difficult. The path is difficult. Some people think being a Christian is really easy. Is it easy? (laughs) No, but Jesus does promise to be with us. Jesus warns all those who wish to follow him to count the cost. He also tells us that the path is narrow and not wide. And there are highs and lows on that journey. And we are encouraged to follow the good shepherd and to place our trust in him like King David did in Psalm 23. Just trying to think, my, my eyesight's not great. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why is that? For you are with me, and your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I would have talked in Sermon 1, you know, God, Jesus doesn't promise us an easy life, even though every single one of us would really, really like an easy life. And some lives are easier than others. But he promises to be with us. 
I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Jesus also teaches us not to despise those whose journey is slower or different than our own. As we will see in the next section of this sermon, we are to be a community of faith, not individual sheep. It may be the problems that we sometimes experience because we are individual sheep and not a community. The challenge for all of us is John 20, 21. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. Having seen yet again how, the, how he found and restored wayward sheep, Jesus commanded his frightened disciples to follow his example. After all, they were strayed, and they were gathered, and they were reconciled, they were commissioned, and they were empowered and sent out to do likewise. Abandoning the faith is not part of this picture. In a way, I think sometimes our own examples, when we become lost, our experiences of Jesus are helpful to, to others. And they're probably there to also to keep us humble as well. Okay, part two. What is the significance of the one and the 99 in the parable of the lost sheep? So you want to flick over? Yeah, thank you. So what do you, it starts off by saying, uh, verse 12. What do you think if a man owns a hundred sheep and one of them wanders away, will he not leave the 99 on the hill and go looking for the one that wandered off? What do you think about this parable? Is Jesus being very irresponsible here? He's left the other 99 sheep to go after the, what, the lost little one. It's the lost one that has gone astray and fallen behind, not the other 99. And where has Jesus left those 99 sheep? On a mountainside, in the open, there aren't any, they aren't left securely in a pen. Doesn't this sound a little reckless to you? Does this sound a little like Jesus is being a bad shepherd? I'm going to do something a little bit radical here because I want to give you a little bit of thinking time. I want you to just, I'm going to sit down for a couple of minutes, discuss with the person next to you what your gut instinct is about that parable. What do you think? That's what Jesus says, verse 12. What do you think? Question mark. What, do you, what is your gut instinct when you hear this parable? Right. Two minutes, speak to the person next to you, and I'll be back up. <laughs> Okay, just drawing you back. I'm glad you've had um, a nice ponder about that, that scripture.
I think it does sound like Jesus has been reckless. We know it can't be just that because he's Jesus, he's the good shepherd. So it's almost like a little trick in our times because we've kind of probably heard sermons about this passage before. We've read it ourselves probably a number of occasions. So it's not quite the same as when Jesus would have spoken to his disciples when he read out or read to them this, this story. Because it does. It's almost like my even, you know, your gut instinct doesn't sound quite right, does it? Going after the one. What about the 99? What about them? What is Jesus doing about them? Now, Jesus could have easily told a story about a shepherd who counted his flock at the end of the day. And then he found one missing. And so he securely housed the other 99 in a nice little pen and then went over, went over and, and sought out the lost sheep. But he didn't do that. So he really did want to kind of talk about them leaving them perhaps in the open on the mountainside. Yeah, the 99 on the hill. So why is he doing that? There's got to be a message in here. There's something he wants to communicate. Now, in the book, The Good Shepherd, by Kenneth E. Bailey, which is where a lot of the, the sermon has come from, um, Kenneth Bailey gives an account of his friend, Dr. Andrew Roy, who was serving in China as a professor under, pres under a pre Presbyterian church. And in 1948, the communists came to power. And within a few weeks, Dr. Roy was arrested and interrogated for two years before being allowed to leave. Dr. Roy's story goes like this. During his interrogation, his communist inquisitors kept trying to convince Roy that the teaching of Jesus were vastly inferior to those of Marx and Chairman Mao Zedong. Jesus' parable of the Good Shepherd was prominent in those interrogations. The communists insisted, they insisted that to leave the 99 in order to go after the one was irresponsible. That's what the communists think. They think Jesus was being irresponsible because the individual had only value as he or she contributed to the people. Jesus left the herd exposed to danger and thereby, according to the communists, failed in his primary task. He irresponsibly risked the safety of the 99. Now there's a thought, isn't it? The individual had only value as he or she contributed to the people. What do you think of that? So basically, it's only what you bring to the group that counts. It's the group that matters. The individual, so that could be me, it could be you, the individual only had only value as he or she contributed to the people. If you, viewed it, if you thought that was right, then Jesus' teaching is inferior to Mark's. So what did Roy say? Well, Roy's answer was the exact opposite. By going after the one, Jesus gave the other sheep boundless security in that each one of them knew if I get lost, he will come after me. A failure to go after the one would leave those same 99 with the ultimate insecurity of realizing if I get lost, he will leave me to die. Yes, there was a risk involved, an undeserved costly love was given to the one, but we each have the capacity to get lost or get left behind. But we have security, and I think this is quite important this, we have security in knowing that Jesus, the good shepherd, will come after us. 
Now, that can happen in a number of ways. I do believe the Holy Spirit is involved in that. I think there's a number of things. And I think he uses people as well to kind of um, find the lost. I'll just come back to, that, back to that in a second. But what about those left on the mountainside? What happens to them while Jesus is away? The church is not a closed or locked society. We can leave that door whenever we want. You know, Jesus doesn't actually confine us like that. There's no kind of barrier. We're not locked in. We are a coming together of a group of individuals. And there are two points I want to make which we need to think about as a community of faith, as Christ Church. The first one is that Jesus trusts us with his absence. And we need to look out for each other and show love and mercy. Now, most of you here are parents. And at some stage, your child or children need to be left by themselves for a period of time. Perhaps you've had to go to the shops or visit someone. In doing so, don't you trust your children with your absence? Don't you rely upon, upon all that you have taught your children over many years and as they have grown up? Isn't a time of absence part of the journey of maturity? Isn't this also true in our own journey of faith with Jesus? Yes, God is omnipresent, and he isn't truly ever absent from us, but he does give us space and room to grow in our faith. Jesus commands put boundaries in place in our lives, some wide boundaries where he says, this is the way I want you to live. Here are the areas I want you to inhabit. But what he wants us to do is grow up in our faith. What he wants, us, what he wants is to put what he has taught us into practice. What he has been teaching us through his word, the Bible, and through the Holy Spirit, which is which is, it? I can't say this now, who is in each one of us. Each one of us has that deposit of the Holy Spirit inside us. Isn't this also how we learn to trust and rely on our Heavenly Father, the Good Shepherd? Isn't Psalm 23 exactly what all this is about? Sometimes church congregations can be unhappy when sometimes they're vicars or youth pastors or whoever it might be spend a lot of time searching for the loss, the, le the, least, the, less, important, the, least, um, the less important members of our congregation or community rather than spending it serving them. Sometimes such flock accuse their pastors of neglecting them. And I just want... We need to be careful about that. Um, you know, Glyn is our vicar. Does he have to watch over us all the time? You know, he is our spiritual leader. God speaks for him in terms of the direction he wants the church to go. He has to build us up and equip us, equip us gives us good teaching. Now, what has God done? For plans for Glenn. What, where should he be going in this church? What should we be doing as a church? It's quite right the vicars and ministers are there to look after their church. But do they have to be in the church all the time? Is this something that applies to us? If it doesn't, it's a danger. The final point really is we need to look out for each other and show love and mercy whilst we on the mounting side. Jesus says, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one, greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Well, the focus here. Jesus is teaching his disciples all about how they're to look after each other when he is gone. And he summarizes all those relationships 
or that they have to do with one simple command. Love each other. Because, coming, because becoming a Christian means that you join a family. We come to Jesus personally as individuals and he says, meet your brothers and sisters. And I'm not saying we're all perfect I and mean, we can be extremely annoying to each other, but that is a family, <laughs> as most of you know. Most families are not perfect. Bizarrely, when I went to um, Israel in October, and although it's a very Catholic, the f- it made me really think that we all did belong to one family. And we have all those little denominations and things. And we can say, this is my little tent over here. But actually, we are one body. And Jesus is the head Becoming a Christian means that you join a family. Jesus says you cannot live in isolation as a Christian. He says we have to love each other. Now I think sometimes Christ Church struggles with this. So why do people find it difficult to love one another? As I say, I've had to repent quite a lot of this as I'm kind of saying this is hard, this is hard for me. Because I, because we, because people often lack grace and mercy for one another and harbor unforgiveness in our hearts. What is true godliness? It's being like God himself, merciful. If we truly want to be blessed, both individually and as a church, we need to be merciful with one another. Matthew 5, 7, Jesus says, Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. How do we make people feel who have let us down or hurt us deeply? Do we make them feel guilty or do we show graciousness? When we show graciousness towards those who have been unkind or unfair to us, We show how much we want of God. But if we seek to punish them or make them feel guilty, we show how we don't want God as much as we thought we did. Through graciousness, showing mercy is letting people off the hook. You don't even tell people what they did to you. After all, that is gossiping. True graciousness is not reminding people of their faults, their failures, or their past. As R.T. Kendall says, it's about letting them save face. Being godly is not giving justice what they deserve, but mercy what they don't deserve. So why should we be mercy? It doesn't seem fair, does it? Why should we be merciful? Again, coming back to... Matthew 5, verse 7. Because Jesus says that you will be shown mercy. The mercy you show, the mercy that you show will follow you. That's Jesus giving us the motivation to do this. He's appealing to our selfish self-interest. And actually, there's quite a lot of things in the Bible that, you know, God knows we are made of dust and he knows we are sinful And there's a lot of things in the Bible about our self-interest. Do it because you will get a benefit from it. Luke 6, 35. Love your enemies, do good to them, and lend lend to them without expecting... Sorry. And lend lend to them without expecting anything back then your reward will be great. If you do this, your reward will be great. If you are merciful, you will be shown mercy. 
It's all about self-interest here. It's amazing that God often appeals to our self-interest to get us to do things. What about that dangerous prayer, the Lord's Prayer? We tend to rattle through that. It's an extremely dangerous prayer. And I think we take it extremely lightly. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. I'm not sure we should really say that unless we mean it. This is a petition and a pledge. It's a petition to God for him to forgive our debts, and it's a pledge as we also have forgiven our debtors. God is merciful to us individually, We are to be merciful in response to his mercy towards us. Okay, drawing the sermon to a close. It's been quite a heavy sermon. The focus of Matthew 18 was very much about grace and mercy. See that you do not look down on one of these little ones. It's all about showing grace and mercy to those within our community whose faith is perhaps less than ours, or who have fallen behind. Jesus says that each one of us is capable of falling behind, and he invites us to go out with him to seek the lost within our fellowship and community. Each one of us is worth the cost and risk of going out and bringing back home. Jesus also trusts us with his absence. That's how we grow in faith, and we trust in him who is our good shepherd. Today's sermon was also an invitation to look within ourselves, to, be, to prayerfully consider how godly we are individually and corporately as a church. Let each of us learn to show mercy to one another and, and not hold grudges and unforgiveness in our hearts because we will be blessed when we do that. Let us also be a little less precious with each other and show grace and love to those who hurt us. Today's sermon was a call to be truly godly. Are we up for that, Christ Church? Amen.